Good morning. Stand with us if you wish. around and it's a good day we have a lot of a lot of people here uh, Mona's family Bridget's friend Mackenzie hopefully that's not putting you on the spot there uh, Katie uh, got my mom in, or not my mom my dad <laughs> my dad and little sister uh, hopefully uh, hopefully you guys don't leave too quickly after service after I said that <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we have a lot of guests and a lot of visitors and, and a few other people that I don't know how they feel about being put on the spot, so I, I won't do that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good Sunday to be here. Uh, and so I don't know if I actually said it, but welcome to those of you that are here and welcome to those watching online and uh, to those in the community that'll, that'll see this at some point this week. A couple quick announcements uh, for this upcoming week. Uh, Bible study will meet on Tuesday night at the Yahshua's house, and uh, we'll take a little bit more of an in-depth in look at Revelation. We're able to do a little bit more when we're, when we're gathered around the table talking about it. So I look forward to, I think it's been three weeks since I've been there, so I'm, I'm looking forward to being back at it. Uh, yesterday was Beach to Beacon, or as my dad likes to call it, Beacon to Beacon. Just to, to throw him under the bus for a minute. Uh, I thought that we had that that, that we had a really good time uh, just sitting around and watching and uh, some of the girls making noises with uh, clappers and cymbals and triangles and frisbees. What was that? All right, well, I wasn't going to say that, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, just out there having fun and being able to, to cheer on the racers and uh, meet some of the people in our community. We had some of our neighbors come and watch with us, and, and it was a good time. And I don't know if you guys have seen or if you guys heard the story, but the person that finished in first place for the main runners, which I don't know if that's a difference between other runners... Okay, okay, because, okay. The, the guy that, that came in first place actually collapsed a couple feet in front of the finish line, to which the second place runner picked him up and carried him over. Uh, and it's just an absolutely beautiful story to read. And um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So the, the, uh, the, articles, the article's in there if anybody wants to take a look at it. Um, today, we will have a potluck and we'll have food and although I'm not officially officially done I still have three more papers to turn in this week this time next Sunday I will be done <laughs> um, done with my master's degree so 
I'm excited about that. Um, or uh, we can also celebrate, and what I think we should also celebrate is, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but today is also Mona's birthday. I was told uh, it is her 16th birthday, so we will celebrate a big one. <laughs> right? Uh, this week, if you could just be in prayer for kids camp, uh, from my understanding, they have 22 different churches uh, represented, and some of those are just sending kids, and some of those are just sending staff or, or different things like that. But um, a lot of people will be up at the uh, China Lake Conference Center for Kids Camp this week, and if you just be in prayer for them um, and for the kids as they come to know come to know more about God and and more about the kingdom. Uh, and for those on the board, um, and for anybody else that would just like to attend, uh, we have a board meeting tomorrow night at 5.30. Um, and I want to give a personal thank you to the trustees who fixed our lights for the sign and for the cross. Um, it's really nice driving by at night and seeing the cross lit up. Um, just that reminder at night that we are to be a beacon of hope and a beacon of holiness and uh, so thank you, trustees, for, for working on that and getting that done and being much smarter than I am and being able to figure out how to do that. But would you receive, um, would you receive now our call to worship? O oh God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, receive this morning our worship. O oh God the Son, redeemer of the world, Receive this morning our worship. O God, the Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the faithful, receive this morning our worship. O holy, blessed, and most glorious Trinity, one God now and forever, receive this morning our worship. Come, let us worship. You're welcome to stand with us today, and we'll worship the Lord. Oh. 
the ushers would uh, prepare themselves for our tithes and offerings, and if you would join me in prayer this morning. God, we are grateful that, that you are present among us. We are grateful that before we can even ask that you be present with us, that you already are. Lord, that all we need to do is be open to see where you are working and to see what you are doing and to see how you are interacting here among us. So, Lord, thank you for gathering with us this morning. I thank you that we can come together and that we can worship and that it's not empty worship, but that it's worship that that raises to you like, like the incense does that we'll read about shortly. God, thank you for, for drawing us together, for creating in many ways a, a family out of, out of people from all over and from different walks of life. Thank you for calling us your church not only those of us locally gathered here in, in Cape Elizabeth at, at the Church of the Nazarene, but also all around the world. All those that are gathered together and all those that have been gathered throughout time that you call us your people. God, we are thankful for that. So God, as your people, we come today and we bring you our tithes and our offerings whether those be monetary offerings or whether they be of our time and of our service, of our gifts and our ability. God, we come humbly before you and, and offer you back a portion of what it is that you've given to us. And so, Lord, as your church, as we prepare to give back to you, we pray this prayer that you would let your continual mercy cleanse and defend your church. And Lord, because it cannot continue in safety without your help, we ask that you protect and govern us by your goodness always, that you continually be present among us, and that we are continually open to your presence. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns, God, with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.
yeah, it, uh, it worked out kind of cool. It wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a family Sunday, um, but in a number of ways it is. We are grateful that Katie was in town to, to be able to do that special for us. And I, I didn't think this through about the doxology afterwards, and I didn't know if you guys were going to switch or what was going to happen. And so I sat there and I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen now. <laughs> I really hope Katie knows what she's doing because I don't. <laughs> and so I'm glad that um, from, from what I've seen uh, out of all the Yashuas I've met, I think most of you guys know more of what you're doing than I do. So, so, so thank you guys for that. Um, and uh, so Diane's normally at the piano and Katie was today and I'm normally up here and I'm still going to preach so you guys don't get out of that. Um, <laughs> But for our readings today, I've put my little sister and my dad on the spot. So, so you might want to say an extra prayer for them. Uh, but would you join me in praying that our hearts be open this morning? Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. And so uh, my little sister Munchkin, or as uh, the government calls her, Cassie, uh, she'll come up and read Revelation 8, and my dad will read Revelation 9 for us. Thank you, guys. Okay. The seventh seal and the golden censer. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. An hour and a half, I mean, yeah, whatever. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came the peals from thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquakes, the trumpets. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an, an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. <laughs> Tough act to follow there, jeez. <laughs> Thanks, Brent, for putting me on a spot. Uh, Revelations 9. The fifth angel sounded his trump trumpet, and I s saw the star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the sh uh, shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the sm smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like the, that of scorpions of the earth. That were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of the scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, 
Men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they were something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like human hair, or like woman's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was like that was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had asked that they had as kings over them the angels of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollon. The first woe is past, and the other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. God. It, is, it said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept away for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted the number of the mounted troops was 100 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplate were fiery, red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of the lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind that were killed by these plagues still did not repent at, of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their gifts, or their thefts. I invite you to stand with us if you wish.
So, so I was thinking this morning as my dad and my little sister were, were reading through um, our scripture readings, historically in the church after a passage of scripture has been read, other than the gospels which have a slightly different ending, people would say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. And as I was listening to these, I kept thinking, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Um, just because it doesn't really sound like passages that one would say thanks be to God for. Um, but yet we say thanks be to God. Um, but yeah, um, that's a different story. So, and part of what I'll, I'll start with today is saying that there's a lot that went on in today's two chapters. And I'll just be up front. I'm not going to get through all of that. Um, that's part of why we have Bible study, is that we can talk more in depth about some of these things, and we can talk about some of the different sim- symbols that come up and, and different stuff like that. But today, I, I kind of want to keep it a little bit broader of a focus. But so we started today's reading um, by my little sister. With, when, when she started reading Revelation 8, the first thing it did was it brought us back to the seven seals, we see that at the, at the start of this reading that the seventh seal is finally opened. Now, if you recall, we had already talked about the, the other six seals, but it wasn't last Sunday. It was two Sundays ago. Last Sunday, we talked about the 144,000 and how really what John means by that is just an infinite amount of people that want to come, that who should, that who should ever want to come they may come and receive the grace of God. So we go from the six seals of judgment to anybody that wants grace, come and get it, back to the seventh seal of judgment where where God finishes, or where John finishes that, that section. One of the commentators that I read this week said this, John has paused just long enough in the action to reassure the faithful that they will not suffer God's wrath during the final acts of judgment and destruction. It was that little break, that little intermission or interlude or whatever we want to call it, that as John is talking about God's judgment that he reminds us, but wait, there's grace. And so in in the beginning of this reading, we see that finally we get to the seventh seal and it's opened. And for me, being somebody that was in theater, when I read through this, I think, okay, like, we've gone one, two, three, four, five, six, taking a break to, like, to talk about some stuff. The seventh one's being open. I'm expecting this big ta-da. Like, I'm expecting something big to happen here. Like, it's the finale here. Like, something's going to happen. Like, I'm expecting fireworks or confetti or something to go, like, boom. And instead, it says there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Every time I read through that, I'm just like, how anticlimactic is that? Like, I'm expecting a big boom, and instead we see the seal has finally been broken. Now let us be silent before God. When the Lamb finally opens the last seal... We don't see a vision of the end coming. We don't see any sort of crazy vision that John normally sees. Instead, we just see silence. Or maybe we don't just see it, but we we hear silence. One of the questions that was posed was why? Why is it silence instead of this big event? Well, one reason is this is a good dramatic effect. Remember, Revelation was to be read to people. And as you get to that part and you say, and then there was silence. And then I imagine the reader probably paused for a bit. And it allowed the reader or the hearer time to take in what had been said. Not only does it allow the reader time Um, to allow the hearer to take in what is being said. But it shows that all of heaven 
is waiting breathlessly for the final events to unfold. There's anticipation building up. It's that when, when, when you're watching that end of the game and it's so close and it's going to be either hit or miss, they either get it or they don't, and you're on the edge of your seat and you're watching what's going to happen next. That's kind of what's taking place here. The heavenly beings that have been noisy and loud and joyous and shouting praises and, uh, and singing hymns as loud as they can now stand quietly in a hushed anticipation. The scroll has been opened. What's going to come now? Another thing that it does is I think it calls us to think forward to the new creation. If we recall in Genesis, in the beginning of the world, there was, there was silence over the world until God spoke things into existence, until God began to speak what would be created. And so here now, before the new creation, before this new creation that's to come, we hear silence. So I, I think in many ways, John is reminding the hearer that there's hope. When things are getting quiet, God might be in the process of beginning to create something. So I think the silence is a call for hope. One of the things that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, I think, at least I think I mentioned it, and if not, we'll, we'll likely talk more about this on Tuesday night, um, is that although there, there's many different aspects of the trumpet's calls and what was happening here, these aren't anything new. So the structure of this part parallels the structure I realized I just skipped a part. So with the trumpets, uh, there, there's lots of things that are going on. As we heard about four trumpets being blasted, and then my dad came up and read about two other trumpets being blasted. And then, not next week, but the week after that, we'll read about the seventh trumpet being blasted. There's a lot going on with the trumpet blast. But before that, I, I want to look at, look at something else. Um, just, just real quickly. So this part with the seven trumpet, they're parallel to the seven seals. We've kind of seen this, this thing before. We've, we've seen this pattern happen already. The first four events in the series are grouped together, followed by the fifth and the sixth event. Right before the seventh event, like I said, there's, there's an interlude or an intermission or some bit of hope that is placed there. And then finally the seventh event occurs in the series, which they both end up back in the heavenly throne room. And so this, this is the part that I mentioned a couple weeks ago, not whatever I said a minute or two ago. Um, but these, event, these events aren't different judgments. They're not something new that we've not already seen. Because one of the issues is we can't read Revelation like a timeline because it gets really confusing because John has ADHD and he jumps back and forth between everything where he's like, we're talking about this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about it like this, and I'm going to talk about it like this again. And so it's kind of more like a spiral that goes down instead of a timeline that goes across. So these events should not be understood necessarily as brand new calamities that are happening or brand new judgments that are taking place. But rather, it's just a different way to put, to put, I'm struggling with that word, different ways to portray God's judgments that are coming to the world. Judgments that it will call us back to restoration and to repentance and back to proper relation, uh, proper relationship with God. So the seals and the trumpets, they overlap rather than following one another chronologically. The trumpets and their judgments are just an, an, a more intense 
version of the divine judgment. <laughs> I, I ended up getting approval, more or less, from my friend this morning when I told him that I was going to mention him in a sermon today. My friend Timmy, who I absolutely love, um, <laughs> it's kind of the butt of all of our jokes in college, just, just a great guy. One of the things that I will always remember about Timmy is that in college, Timmy had, I don't know how to say this nicely, but Timmy had the dumbest joke I've ever heard. Um, it was just, it was bad. Um, and we, we've all just called it the line joke, or whenever we talk about the line, all of our friends know what we're talking about if we're talking about it in relation to Timmy. The first time Timmy told this joke, it was three minutes. By the end of the summer, we had worked together at summer camp, and he was telling a friend right before Andrew's wedding. By that point, the joke was like 33 minutes. Just every time he told it, it got longer and longer and longer, and the type of lines got crazier and crazier and crazier. And just so, so every time Timmy told this, and I won't tell it now because it's, it'll take up too much time, but, but maybe at some other point. But he tells this joke, and the first time you hear it, you groan. You just look at him, and you're like, Timmy, stop. Stop talking, Timmy. Stop it. But then after you know the joke, and he begins to tell it to other people, and he adds two or three more minutes to the joke, or he adds 10 minutes to the joke, we would be over there just laughing hysterically, crying, while everybody else was looking at him like, I don't get it. What is so funny? And it just got more and more intense as he told it. And if Timmy's ever in town, I'll, I'll have him tell it, because by that point, it'll probably take up the entire service. Um, it just gets more and more intense every time. And so when I, when I thought about these passages, I thought kind of about how John is kind of like Timmy. He's telling the same thing, but he's getting more intense with it. The punchline is still the same, but it's getting more intense as to how he gets there. With the seals, we saw that it was just humanity that was affected, and it was a third of, or it was a fourth of humanity um, that, that was wiped away. To here we see that not only is it humanity, it's the entire earth that's being affected. And not only is it a, th a fourth, it's now to a third. Things are getting bigger and bigger and more intense. And John is, is telling his hearers, repent, repent. God is calling us to restoration. And he's getting more and more intense about it. Kind of like... Um, if it's okay to make this joke, the song, Just As I Am, you know, you sing it once, and if nobody comes to the altar, you sing it again, and if nobody comes to the altar, you sing it a third time, and if still nobody comes, you start playing it a little louder and a little stronger, and eventually you have the whole church coming to the altar. It's kind of like that. John is pushing the intensity of, all right, guys, you really need to come to repentance. We need to see, we need to see the judgment of God here. And so things keep getting more and more intense. But as we've said a number of times throughout this series, Revelation is not necessarily to be taken literally. It's not that these things are meant to have a literal happening as to perfectly line up in any sort of way, but instead, as John gets more intense in his telling of what's going to happen, it adds dramatic tension and it, it signals to the hearers, the end is coming. And that's not a bad thing. It's not, it's not the guy on the highway carrying the sign that says, the end is near, the end is near. But instead, it's kind of more like the beginning is coming. Something new is about to happen. Be ready. Be ready for this new thing that God is doing. At this point, the reader or the hearer begins to sense 
that there's a forward movement happening in this end time drama. The events that we that we'll talk about on on Tuesday night, the events that are happening um, in relation to the trumpets being sounded. If you look at them closely, you should think of the story of Exodus, and you should think of the plagues that happened in Egypt, because they're pretty much the same going on here. There's an Exodus motif that that is displayed prominently in the book of Revelation. This idea of being taken out of slavery and brought into freedom. For John, he recognizes the Roman emperor as Pharaoh, the one that has enslaved and oppressed the people of God. As the Egyptians, er, yeah, as the Egyptians, as the Israelites journeyed from Egypt or as they had done that, they were preceded by plagues of judgment against the land of Egypt. Here we see a new series of plagues that will bring God's judgment upon a disobedient emperor or empire again. Again, that this isn't, it isn't God trying to get revenge, but instead it's God's judgment is always to call us to something better. It is God's way of saying, this is wrong, and you need to quit it, and you need to turn back, and you need to, to come towards me, for there is joy and victory in me. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that on Tuesday night, talking about the, uh, the locust with the crazy lion teeth and how as much as uh, some writers from the 80s would like us to believe, those are not Apache helicopters. Um, <laughs> um, I don't really know what an Apache helicopter looks like. My dad, could, my dad probably knows, but I don't, I don't think those are giant locusts. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what it actually does mean and what it means to hear these crazy visions and these crazy judgments and how they're not a bad thing, and how they're a good thing. So I don't know if you guys could tell, but I would love for people, for all of you guys to come to Bible study, um, as, it, as it gives us more time to, to discuss some really, really important things that are happening in the book. And so although I've not gone into too much detail about what these trumpets are, what I do want to say is that even with these trumpets and even though they seem to call for some crazy things like the locust with the, with the lion's teeth and the scorpion tail or whatever it is, it always jumps out to me. Although these trumpets seem to call for some crazy things to happen, really when we, when we read Revelation responsibly, and when we step into John's world and we look at it how John and his hearers would have, we see what's really going on is that John is calling the world to repentance. That God is calling the world to turn towards Christ, to turn towards the Lamb, to turn towards the one who truly does rule the world. That he is reminding Christians and that not only is he reminding Christians, but he's also calling the world to follow God faithfully, to live into the witness of the Lamb. As we saw last week, and as we'll see again next week, even amidst God's crazy judgment, his good judgment, his judgment that when John writes about it is just unbelievable imagery as we as we hear about God's judgment we'll see God's grace in the middle of it that God's goodness and God's mercy and God's grace cannot be separated from his judgment we'll continue to see that when God when God places judgment upon the earth 
it's not because God is up there shaking his fist all angry, but because God is opening his arms saying, just come back to me. God's judgment is meant to be restorative. It's meant to put us back in a right relation. God's judgment is a call for a new creation, for a recreation of the world where heaven and earth meet again. If we think about the Exodus story again, we see that God's people have been led into freedom. The people of God is then formed. John, through these plagues, through these trumpet blasts, reminds us that we are being called to freedom and out of slavery, that we're being called to victory in the Lamb, and that like the Israelites, we will soon be entering the promised land. But that's not a set place on earth. As beautiful as I think Cape Elizabeth is and as beautiful as I think the Portland headlight is, that's not the promised land. As beautiful as I think the hills in Ireland are, those aren't the promised land. The promised land is heaven coming down to meet earth, the great city that we'll see at the end of Revelation. The promised land is the restoration and recreation of all the world. It's a restorative thing. Would you pray with me this morning? God, as you call the world and your people into judgment, would you constantly remind us that it is a good thing and not a bad thing? For it draws us closer to you. It forms us into a more faithful witness of your Son. God, you remind us, would you remind us that your grace and your mercy cannot be separated from your judgment? That your judgment is not, that it's not meant to damn us, but that it's meant to save us. But that we have free will and that we don't have to listen to your judgments. That we can turn from them and, and instead of being saved and instead of being restored, that we can choose to go another way if we wish. Would you help us and would you help the world though to see that that's not the way we wanna go? That we wanna respond to your judgment in joy and in discipleship and in faithfulness. That these things are not meant for our demise, but that they're meant for our upbringing and our restoration that these things are love and not anger. And God, I, as, I, as, I think about, as I think about Romans, when it talks about the wrath of God is not God throwing lightning bolts at us from above, but rather it's God saying, all right, you do you. That's what you want. God, would you help us to not, not bring on these, these terrible judgments upon ourselves, that we would live a life where, where we don't end up biting ourselves because of something we've done. Would you continue to lead us and guide us? Would you continue to show us your faithfulness? Would you help us be receptive of the directions that you are calling us into? And would you use the things that we have done not against us, but rather, rather in a way that helps to draw us closer to you? God, as we prepare to come to your tables this day, would you help us 
to know that you are meeting us here, that your judgments are out of love, and that any and all can, can respond to your judgment in a positive manner, to which they say, oh, yeah, I should probably turn towards Christ and walk towards him. May we continue in our journey towards you, O oh God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Please prepare your hearts for a time of prayer. Would you join me in prayer? <coughs> blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. We have a great high priest, one that has passed into the heavens, Jesus our Lord, the Son of God. So let us come boldly now to the, let us come boldly now to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, that we may find grace, and that we may realize that his judgment is good, and that his judgment calls us to repentance and to a life more closely aligned with his. Let us take just a moment 
to confess our sins to God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds by those things which we have done and by those things which we have left undone. We admit, God, that there are times when we have not loved you with our whole heart. And there have been times where we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For these, we are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, O God, that we may delight in your will and walk closer in your ways, that we may give glory to your name. And Lord, thank you for reminding us that you are the Almighty and the merciful Lord. You are the one that gives us forgiveness, that you are the one that cleanses us of all our sins, that when we come in true repentance, that you are faithful to say, you are forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you this morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You are faithful in your judgments, calling us to restoration, to hope, and to peace. And so with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. In him there is grace abundant to be found. Lord, your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, Lord God, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery of sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and by spirit. And so on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks over it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he told them, take this and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later that night, when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave it to his disciples, and he, and he said to them, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant which has been poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as holy and living sacrifices in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery that is our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O Lord, and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. For we are called to be saints and to help bring the world to Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. Make us one with one another and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again in final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Would you pray with me with confidence that which Christ has taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespass, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One of the things that I've liked uh, to have remind people about communion is that this is judgment. It's the judgment that says there is grace enough for you. It's the judgment that says all you have to do is come and receive. But as I thought about it this morning, I may actually be slightly wrong in that. As I think about weekly how I take the Eucharistic elements to Diane and to, uh, to Paul, that they receive, that they don't, they don't necessarily even have to come to receive it, but that like, like the prodigal father, God takes his grace and all one has to do is receive. I think of the times where I've been unable to pick myself up and to come to God. And instead he has come to me and has said, just receive. I think about that as we, as we think about God's judgment. I think sometimes there are some of us that think that we can't pick ourselves up and go to God. And God just says, receive. And so I wasn't planning on doing it this way today. Um, but I'm going to now that, I, now that I'm thinking about it. But if you're okay with it, and I know this is different, and I don't know if we've done it this way, but I would just like to bring the elements to you this morning that you don't have to get up, that you don't have to, that you don't have to come, that you just have to be open to receiving them. And so if that's okay with you all today, I'll do it a little differently this morning. And I'll do it differently too. I'll start with the people I normally start last with. And then if you guys wanna play music or whatever it is you wanna do.
That was a little different. Hopefully that was okay though. As I think about God's judgment, I can't help but think about how it really is God coming to us and how it's about God working in us and working through us and working for us to draw him closer to him and to become better kingdom people and to be better witnesses in the world for him. And as I was walking around, there was a few points where I thought, this is kind of awkward. But then I thought about the grace of God and how there's been times where it's come to me and I'm like, this is kind of awkward, God. I'm supposed to come to you and God's like, nope, just receive and then live into what I'm telling you. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Continually call us to restoration and to recreation. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for the sake of others. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand together for our hymn of sending. benediction this morning. As we leave, let us bless the Lord. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Go in grace and peace to love and serve the Lord and neighbor. You are dismissed, and let's eat. <laughs>